technical session starts with uh, petroleum resources onshore and offshore exploration for petroleum may i request chairperson dr sushma rawat madam to come and come on the stage please and along with dr No, uh, I I hand over the uh, mic to you for the first. So good afternoon once again. If we are ready, then I'll just take you through what ONGC is doing. from the conventional to the renewables what is it that we have thought what we are right now and where do we aim to uh, you know be by the end of uh, 2050 so as i was talking uh, when we talk of ongc uh, the ongc itself is an exploration and production company but when you look at the entire ongc group of companies we are an integrated uh i would say it's almost like an mnc right from exploration to uh, which is the part of the upstream uh, conventional upstream to the midstream and uh, then into uh, the downstream of refining uh, as well and uh, as you would be noticing we also have a vertical which will be addressing renewables in the near future we had an energy strategy uh, uh, held in uh, 2018 uh, in which uh, uh, it was called es 2040 so in that we had different verticals where we thought you know after the oil and gas uh, era gets over what is ongc group of companies going to focus on so that is where the idea started getting concentrated as to within the renewables within the non conventional oil and gas where is it that uh, ongc can venture into and uh, uh, what is it that ongc can offer uh, in terms of uh, you know for the growth of the nation so i i'm not going to read out the entire thing but just go through uh, these are the footprints of ongc as i already mentioned uh, we have the uh, a national company which looks after the indian sedimentary basins does exploration and production from the sedimentary basins of india and we also have a foreign uh, company foreign uh, arm of the ongc group of company which uh, which is uh, right now in 15 countries of the world uh, around uh, we have 35 blocks so uh, these are just the numbers telling you uh, about uh, the size of ongc its market cap uh, the entire gamut and what we spend in different aspects uh, there was some question regarding csr so in uh, we have one institute i'll be coming to that along with that most of the csr projects that uh, ongc funds or undertakes they are either in the health of education Uh, uh in the in the area of uh, health education or skill development along with sustainable uh, development and environment <coughs> so this is coming back home this is uh, the idea of the different sedimentary basins in which you would come to know uh, what is on the on land what is in the shallow offshore and what is in the deep water offshore so as i was mentioning uh, we have got data of geochemical uh, non seismic like remote sensing and gravity magnetic then we have seismic survey data as well as drilled well data of almost all of these basins which have been categorized into category 1 2 and 3 
So coming to the R&D institutes, there are ar around 10 R&D institutes uh, within ONGC of which seven of them uh, come under the AGs of exploration. Two are in the area of production uh, for engineering and we have one specific institute which caters to the environmental, uh, environment, uh, health and uh, safety. So uh, coming to today's topic, you know, what is it that is there in the future? So in the, in the present uh, times, the mankind is under tremendous pressure, you know, of two major threats. One is uh, very, uh, it will be very cataclysmic and very instant of nuclear holocaust. And the other is the uncontrolled uh, global warming, as you can see from the picture that we have. So this is something uh, which we intend to, uh, you know, address and which is of our making. So uh, the global warming, even with limiting two degree scenario of Paris Agreement leads to heavy rainfall events. A lot of speakers before me have mentioned extreme weather, forest fires, biodiversity loss, sea level rise, the coastal flooding and rise in the ocean temperature. Acidification also, the changes in the EHPH, that is a threat to the marine life, flora and fauna as well. Destruction of the coral reefs and lower rice seals, as well as the lowering of the nutritional value of the food itself. So uh, we can broadly uh, attribute these uh, rise in the global temperatures to uh, uh, some reasons which are unknown to us, might be they have stellar origin, but they are known events uh, and their causes are not yet fully understood. So uh, these are the climatic changes and uh, the uh, natural uh, changes in the natural uh, climatic patterns. Uh, we have a lot of literature uh, regarding the study of El Nino as, as well as La uh, Nina effects. Uh, we have had a number of cyclones. In fact, the recent Bipar Joy cyclone, we were just commenting because we had to safeguard the offshore platforms and the production facilities. So we were just mentioning that such cyclones have become more in number, you know, in a shorter period of time. Arabian Sea actually did not see too many cyclones. It was rather the Bay of Bengal. But of late, we have, uh, we have, uh, we had talked, uh, uh, you know, two years back, it was a very, very intense cyclone. And uh, recently we uh, had to get ready for Bepar Joy. So might be all this gets connected to the climate changes. And I think, uh, for the people who are the students of earth sciences and uh, the systems uh, and the processes related to it, I think uh, it is very pertinent for them to start studying the causes and effects of these kind of features. So, uh, of course, the release of different gases, uh, their sources of origin, be it coal, be it oil and, ga uh, oil and gas, uh, be it the uh, CFCs. So all this is leading to the uh, increase in the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As we have seen, the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, they have increased and over here we have the number e of years. So 1800s is the time when coal started getting used for steam engine, locomotive and under other industrial um, usage and uh, as a source of energy. And we can see the present concentration of CO2 has risen up so rapidly. Similarly with the uh, global fossil uh, carbon dioxide emission, so the dips which you see are the energy crisis where the price of oil had ga gone up. So the usage came down. The uh, last dip being the COVID-19 pandemic event, which saw almost uh, negative uh, prices in uh, the uh, oil and gas. So uh, this is uh, the uh, contribution to global emission per capita. Of course, you can see, uh, sorry. Yeah, you can see uh, India stands here. This the uh, from the uh, lowest. This is the third most. 
uh, and uh, because of the uh, population, because of the number of people uh, in this nation, the per capita contribution, though it is much less, but over the years this is going to rise and is an area of concern for us. And uh, But the development uh, or the developed countries, they are showing a much, much higher per capita uh, emission contribution. So, uh, in terms of the industry, as you can see, uh, your rise uh, in the fossil fuel usage, it has gone up, and the sector-wise contribution uh, for the energy sector, the agriculture also is one uh, big area where the methane uh, emission into the atmosphere is uh, very high. Then, of course, uh, industrial processes, the land use changes, forestry as well as waste. So, uh, within the oil and gas sector, especially for ONGC, we are trying to bring down emissions and these are the areas where the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions are monitored. So, uh, we uh, initially, I, a lot of you would recall, you would see a huge uh, flare or a fire uh, at the end of a producing or a production platform. So that is the, uh, the flare gas, the associated gas that comes up with the production of oil and uh, it used to be flared. So that is one area we are addressing and trying to capture that flare gas as well. In a lot of the drilling uh, sh uh, drill ships as well as the platforms, this gas which used to be initially flared now is being used as a source of energy for the uh, running of the platform itself. Then uh, we are doing this by, uh, you know, installing small compressors and plants. Uh, renewable energy, I have been talking solar, then wind, then we have geothermal, uh, biofuels, and uh, we are also uh, going strong uh, in the area of uh, the waste management, as well as uh, the uh, recent uh, uh, you know, uh, biomass, the, the BMGs, uh, the plants itself. Then uh, we have the uh, ships and the equipments, they are being made of lighter material. The designs of the platforms that is being, uh, you know, made in a way where the tugging and uh, the construction itself requires lesser amount of material, steel. Then uh, captive power generation using uh, natural gas. The replacing, as I said, replacing of the diesel gensets with the gas gensets. That is on the rigs and uh, the platforms. And then micro turbines, ga uh, dynamic gas blending, uh, usage of biofuels and using compressed air for instrumentation and global methane uh, initiative. That is the GMI program that uh, the ONGC has started. So, uh, over the years, as you can see, the fossil fuel direct emissions uh, profile of ONGC uh, from 10.83 in 1314, over the years it has been reduced uh, to a single digit number and uh, uh, this is what we are trying to achieve. Along with that, uh, the electricity or the indirect emissions also, which form a part of scope two, uh, they are coming down and uh, are uh, goal for reaching scope 1 is uh, 2030 and for uh, scope 2 it is 2038. So uh, the scope 1, scope 2 and the fugitive emissions uh, in terms of MMTCO2 emissions uh, for 22-23, these are the targets and this is what we achieve. So, uh, 23 forms the baseline, 50% re reduction emissions by 2030, and then 95 to 100%, so that we are scope one, scope two, net zero by 2038. So, this broadly, uh, you know, this is the roadmap that has been chalked out. Uh, this is to say that what we have said is just not a number. We have actually thought over it, uh, stage gate, um, approach has been adopted 
and uh, these are as i was talking to you about various aspects this is there other than that we are also into the area of carbon capture which a lot of people would uh, you would have heard about carbon capture and underground sequestration so this we have already initiated a pro project in the western onland uh, uh, one of the fields which is called gandhar in which we are going to source the carbon dioxide emission from a refinery of indian oil and that is going to be uh, compressed and pumped uh, underground and uh, which will lead to enhanced oil recovery also so right down it is uh, i mean right now it is in this stage of discussion because the fiscals of it are coming very high so we are also looking towards uh, formulation of policies from the government side because sourcing and compressing of uh, carbon dioxide right now is very expensive so uh, but in the future i think this is one area wherein we can benefit a lot and ongc has got a lot of spent reservoirs or reservoirs where which are non non oil bearing but uh, water i mean saline water or water bearing reservoirs so uh, these reservoirs are also being mapped right now we also have a mou with a equinor which is an international company and total uh, wherein we are discussing this uh, equinor has a very successful project in the uh, um, uh, in uh, near norway which is called the northern night lights and uh, they have uh, shown interest that this kind of carbon capture can be done in, in india as well so uh, i have talked a lot about ge uh, geothermal biofuels also and then uh, of course uh, we have the battery energy storage system uh, which we are trying to work out wherever there is, is uh, hydro hydropower available you know so the uh, psp uh, we are going to go we have a mou uh, in the green hydrogen and green ammonia area with uh, green co uh, for green ammonia and uh, uh, shell as i already said for gandhar uh, then uh, zero root flaring uh, another uh, initiative that, that we have taken and in the solar we have uh, signed an mou with the government of rajasthan uh, of this uh, five uh, of this five uh, gigawatt uh, one gigawatt has already been set up so we are also uh, in talks with various state governments for going for these uh, renewable projects then uh, compressed biogas biofuel we intend setting up 25 B uh, cbg plants so in this also we are trying to look at areas or cities where the uh, you know the uh, per day requirement tonnage of waste is sufficient to make the project viable so uh, these are the things of course uh, renewables is a new area for us but i think with the kind of uh, uh, expertise that we have and the talent pool we have in terms of uh, you know uh, the basic uh, qualification we have amongst the uh, 3000 plus people within exploration other than geology and geophysics we have people from chemistry we have people from reservoir and they have a tremendous amount of experience as well as knowledge so uh, i think uh, that way ongc and the focus now has of course started turning there also also the uh, engineers pool within the company uh, it is quite a large pool so from there we are trying to build the uh, new vertical which will be focusing on to the renewables thank you thank you so much thank you very much ma'am for uh, providing a nice glimpse of the uh, greenhouse gas as well as the renewables and the efforts which ong is doing in the direction of climate change i don't think i think can we allow one question just one question if there is any i think there is nothing so people may interact with ma'am she is here only i think till the session thank you very much ma'am please thank you thank you sir
Uh, with this, uh, we come to the second keynote address by Dr. Sudhir Sukla, sir. Balancing India's energy, mixed difficult options for a competitive economy under global climate watchdogs. Dahas, I chose this topic because this is one of the hottest topics nowadays and every other day everybody is talking. And uh, I think there is nobody, no single fellow, the, I think the most learned people to the ordinary persons who are talking about these things. And uh, if you remember, only yesterday, Prime Minister in his speech in Washington, he also spoke of many of these things. So it's a difficult thing. Uh, this is the overview, where I'll be just uh, giving a few points on the global energy scenario, Indian energy diaspora, then oil and gas in India. These are the sectors already Madam has explained in our previous presidential address. Then geoscience, it is the backbone of conventional and unconventional resources, but now we are moving to the renewables. So for that, geoscience is a lot of threat also. Geoscience needs to change. Then role of geoscience in the transition, energy transition. Then uh, role of environmental and engineering uh, geologists. These are the new roles which are coming up for uh, geoscience and more particularly to the geology students. Then uh, how the transition will impact the scientific research and academics and uh, energy mix options, difficulties, obviously there are many difficulties and so on. I'm, I'm obviously, I am thankful to the GGS and uh, Geological Survey of India for giving me this opportunity to present uh, uh, this scientific matter before you. Uh, I have taken most of the data from the available uh, resources which are public, anybody, and I was uh, studying these things of late. So I found very interesting things in, so major contributors, major information centers I have just mentioned here. Now we go to the geology, uh, global energy scenario. What are the key drivers and options available to us? There are certain facts. World population is estimated at 9.5 billion uh, to be by 45. Everybody knows it's ever increasing. And uh, uh, there is a need of globe, green, clean energy as growth driver. Then the fossil fuel share in overall basket has to come down from 86 to 54 percent by 2050. Mostly if you, if you go to the IEA reports and the, the other uh, documents, you will find all this data there. Oil peak, they have said that it is supposedly was in the 2019 and gas peak is from the present 26 to 29 percent by 2032. Similarly, renewables such as solar, wind, geothermal are likely to contribute 12, 11 and 3.5 percent respectively by 2050. Then prime consumers and importers like US, Western Europe, India and China will not be unified on pricing issues. There are different geopolitical issues and because of there, the sellers will always have an upper hand to manipulate the prices. A role of oil as transportation fuel will slowly fade away to EVs and hydrogen. But only, I think, two days back, one of the WhatsApp groups which we have, the XONGC geologist group, in that a very interesting uh, uh, video was shared where the, this uh, mm -hmm. Toyota CEO, Toyota CEO has brought out an excellent video. I have that in my laptop. If some youngster or some people are interested, I can show it to them. They have said that now we are just going for, instead of EV, EV is also getting, going to be out, outdated because this hydrogen is coming in a big way. And uh, earlier, we have what we used to uh, tell amongst ourselves, ki kya pani se gaadi chalti hai? So that is going to be fact. Pani se gaadi chalegi, what they have opined. That's a very interesting video I'll share with you people. So <coughs> if we go, 
this is one green area and very sunrise area which is crude oil to chemicals and many indian is industries they are especially the reliance and other such such industries they are getting into this crude oil to chemicals and if you remember the latest post ukraine war reliance and these companies they have been benefited much on this aspect they have been a great importers and great sellers to the world world over now oil and coal decline from the current levels is to be affected by 2050 and then the green hydrogen this is supposedly the cleanest future and this is the future of the uh, uh, future of the uh, green energy then we have already seen we many people have spoken that green in uh, uh, this global zero emission targets they have been spread from 40 onwards to 2070 and india has chosen 2070 in the glasgow 2021 <coughs> meeting petroleum ex activities particularly in india i think that they are not going to be subdued in recent future because we have a lot of fields which need to be monetized and they do need to be developed and uh, larger quantities of producible oil with the saudi iran you say russia and all these countries will also be available for the monetization then usa canada will continue uh, shale oil monetization with huge investments in production and r and d technologies now let us see some points in the indian diaspora what are what is happening india is a major player in present and future global economy no doubts about it so energy consumption population economic growth all go in hand to hand to hand and they are just going up and up 80% of india's energy requirement presently meets with the coal oil and solid biomass this needs to change now non conventional resources we have coal bed methane gas hydrate basin centered gas shallow gas shale gas oil geothermal and ongc is very well into all these things and they have been working uh, here we have an i think a very detailed presentation by dr james peters i think in afternoon on the cbm and then if we go to the renew oh sorry we go to the renewable solar hydel wind electrical hydrogen nuclear tidal all these things we we know that they are the future and they will be their effect will obviously they will be uh, contributing more in the energy basket and then reducing the share of the conventional energy so modern renewable energy resources will are the latest fad also i i i call it latest fad every other private industry they are just mentioning that they are going in for uh, clean energy and modern energy these are some indicators for india if you see that's a 10 years uh, gap histogram and if you see population gdp energy demand everything goes up it's a very well known fact only thing is when we when we go to the energy demand the demand for Uh, renewables will go on increasing as compared to the conventional or traditional uh, uh, whatever uh, resources were there this is also this is the primary demand energy demand for india up to 2020 of uh, at a gap of 10 years where you have a large share of now modern renewables and other as compared to the previously coal and oil and those things there there are some histograms and some drawings which uh, i think which you can very well know that uh, estimated reserves of coal in india as on 1422 were that indicated were 41 proven were 52 and 7% were in for resources and i uh, likewise if you see the, there is a production and consumption going up 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 to 21 22 growth is also if you see that crude oil growth is less as compared to the coal and lignite we see uh, uh, that estimated reserves 
Western offshore Gujarat and Assam and Rajasthan, they are contributing most in the crude oil reserves. And similarly, if you see the gas reserves, they are Eastern offshore and Western offshore, and Assam, they are contributing to the more. Now, if you go to the renewable powers, renewable power, if you see the maximum power is presently from the wind and the solar, whereas state-wise also a breakup is given where we have the Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra and Karnataka. These four states, they are the pioneer and they have a bigger share in these things. If you go by the total energy generated and total energy consumption, where we, uh, the type of the resource. So if you see the coal contributes, still the coal contributes the maximum, followed by the crude oil and gas. It's a fact up to 22. Uh, this, this needs to be changed by the, uh, say, more discoveries and R&D in the renewable sector. So, few points that uh, this, in fact, the research nowadays is concentrating on all the panch tattvas, what we say, the water, air, fire, matter, earth and space. Hydrogen is one of the examples where hydrogen now, they're, they're, they're trying to dissociate uh, H2O, water, into hydrogen and producing oxygen, which is absolutely useful thing for the mankind. And uh, here in review of uh, 2022 Ministry of New and Re Renewable Ener uh, Energy Resources, India uh, is shown as fourth in the renewable energy installed capacity with the solar power capacities of 172.72 gigawatts and the non-fossil fuel capacity installed up to 31.22. Power generation is also increasing and similarly, hydrogen, lithium, wind energy, and other renewables, there is a tremendous growth in, uh, growth in the past decades. All private sector as well as the public sector, as Madam has also shown, that ONGC is also going in a big way in the renewables. So we, we feel that uh, <clears throat> under the green, National Green Hydrogen Mission, all these companies, whether private or public, they are focusing on it. This is also the key parameters, okay, we can skip that. So now, I am basically a geologist, so I will focus on the geology and there are, what are the problems in the geology. This is just for the students, I think I can skip it. This, the, this shows the governance of the energy sector by the central government. We have several ministries who are responsible, who, who are responsible for different types of resources, whether conventional or uh, non-conventional or renewable resources. Yes, for the benefit of students, the oil sector from which I also come, uh, that's divided to upstream, midstream and downstream sector. Upstream has the exploration and the downstream has the refining, marketing and consumer end phase. Now, let us see this important thing, that role of geoscience in energy transition. Okay, this is what traditionally we have been doing in the geoscientific invest investigations in the conventional area. Uh, in the, like a company like ONGC does all these things from reconnaissance stage to high-end workstation-based studies and to laboratory studies to geology studies in sedimentology, biostratigraphy, chemistratigraphy, remote sensing, geochronology, and so on, by reservoir characterization, then using of the remote sensing data, and then high-level integration with the reservoir microfaces, then uh, petroleum system modeling, of which uh, Madam was uh, the team leader in KDM IEP when I was also there. Then the, in unconventional laboratories, there are studies going on for the shale gas and other BCG tight gas, deep gas things. Gas hydrate, of course, this was a big program in the NGHP program with the ONGC combining with other things. And uh, they had made quite a good progress where they had uh, found out uh, huge resources. But I think, uh, as I understand, uh, the exploitation is the main main issue. 
I was reading this uh, one uh, paper by Ole Martinson in Equinor, who says that uh, geoscience, of course, is the core of the energy transition of high value oil and gas, but they are already under the pressure for availability, value, and the sustainability. And now, industry is finding that uh, it has operational financial capacity, technological capital, and human resources, but pro and projection skills, project execution skills for the transition. And geoscience provides leads to the mapping and valuation and all these things. But to accomplish geoscience, application must be broadened beyond oil and gas to the geothermal, wind, sea, energy, tides, lithium, radioactive, mineral exploration, and so on. Wind turbines are founded, carbon dioxide is stored. In these, all these things in uh, renewables also, he has postulated the use of uh, geoscience and geology in his studies. Now, he says that uh, in changing paradigms of global energy transition, newer forms of energy are emerging every day. And uh, a big question has come up, that uh, whether geoscience will lose relevance, in particular with the context of the renewables. So, unfortunately, in ONGC, the situation is not that scary, as we, I think ONGC has found Amrit and Munga in just in, I think, May, last month only, two, two offshore discoveries. So we still we have a lot of hope with the ONGC and a uh, lot of hope with the conventional studies in the field of hydrocarbons. And uh, yes, the use of artificial in intelligence, digitization, environmental climatic studies, they are getting into focus, they are getting more and more in the uh, uh, industry as well as in the, they should be, we feel that they should be brought it into the UG and PG courses in the universities. <coughs> Another gentleman, Mike Simmons, along with Andy Davis, he wrote in the research gate, he wrote that uh, once we are passing through the energy transition, although the geoscientists were in past, they were very, very much revered and uh, they were the key people in the hydrocarbon exploration. But whether this is going to sustain, to continue a career in geology, sustainable geoscience. They have given a concept of sustainable geoscience. That uh, despite the growth in renewables, energy mix for few decades, next few decades is not going to be much affected by the oil, gas and also the coal. So we have to accordingly, this is particularly for the academia, that they have to accordingly modify their approach to the applied aspects of the uh, rather geoscience, rather than going for the old type of syllabus. And then they need to contribute to the carbon neutrality targets, carbon capture and sequestration studies, such type of research, and engineering geology which is also contributing a lot to the wind farm developments and also to the mitigating climate changes and, of course, the geothermal energy. So, another, say, aspect of the geoscience should also focus to the, uh, uh, say, the search of the minerals uh, which could be useful in the process of renewable, uh, uh, renewable energies. This was another say, article which was there that they, this uh, SEPM, in SEPM article came that who needs a stratigrapher, sedimentologist and paleontologist. So they have also discussed the evolving roles through the energy transitions for geoscientists and more particularly to the geologists. So increasingly the roles of environmental and engineering geologists is also coming. So the AEG, AEG is the Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists. They are taking up, this is I think in Britain 
and they, they are developing professional responsibility on the part of environmental geologists, engineering geologists and hydrogeologists by providing technical and professional short courses, seminars and technical meetings. AEG members, they also contribute to the public safety and education through websites and they are just supporting the students in the field of applied geology through the strong development of a strong technical backgrounds. Environmental geologists, they also t help to prevent uh, and repair damage to our nation's uh, wetlands, streams, rivers and shorelines. These are all getting helpful, giving some help to the climatic and environmental studies which are also in the focus. <coughs> they have, they, they research on the knowledge uh, how rivers get eroded and deposit sediments, how streams channel migrates, how surface water and groundwater interacts, and after all such things, shoreline changes, and land development, contribute in the land development and infrastructure projects, etc. Community disaster response plans for earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. So they are helping in the uh, society as well as in the, um, I think, in the energy transition. So again, that uh, they're trying to mitigate this question. This question is getting stronger and strongerly debated. That is the role of geoscience diminishing. So at least uh, my uh, idea is that in near future, it's not getting, it will be very, very much useful in the conventional as well as in the unconventional energy resources. And now what the best thing, what they're trying to do is to utilize this role of geosciences in the renewables also. Yes. So if we come to the balancing act for uh, India, so if we see, we still say 80% 80, 80 of our primary energy requirements is met by the oil and gas and coal. And coal will also be dominating, gas and coal will be dominating up to 2040. And uh, hydrocarbons potential of sedimentary basins is progressing by government li liberalized policies like NLP, OLP, and uh, we have the resources which are getting upgraded. And as I mentioned that there are two discoveries made by the NGC recently, last month in the Western offshore also. So, since o o India is home to 18 to 20 percent of the world's population and is responsible for 6.4 percent of the total global emission and per capita emission 1.6 against the 4.4 tons of global average, government's effort for capacity ramping in renewables is going on and they have set up very big targets like say 134 gigabyte by 175 by 22 and 450 gigabyte by 30. So our primary energy consumption is also going up, which is very well known to all of us. And together with it, we'll be adding the 50, 400 million people with the rapid urbanization. So uh, Accordingly, the resources, whether conventional or unconventional or renewable, they will also be required much and much. Now, if we see that uh, how it is affecting the natural resources on our climate change and everything, so we have seen that water and air, air are used like commodities nowadays, and uh, wind, solar, and other are. Uh, others are having increasingly a bigger role in future. And sur subsurface storage of anthropogenic uh, CO2 does not come with the geological risk of safe storage. And uh, in all these things, geoscience is certainly going to help in the climate change because geoscience can tell you that what is preserved in the rocks and how, how best we can deduce these things from the rocks already either from the fossils or from the sediments and then uh, give a direction to the future. 
So these things, uh, I think a lot of things have already been discussed by Madam and greenhouse gas. This is we'll skip. There is another issue coming on the sustainability and SDG goals. This uh, United Nations Assembly in its uh, 70th session, they spoke of the transforming our world 2030 agenda, where they have put some sustainability development SDG goals they have given, and each goal, especially the goal number seven, it has a lot of targets. So every country is uh, trying to meet these things, and India is also particularly, more particularly to the goal seven. They are meeting, they have set up things to meet the target. Those are these things. So energy from the re renewable resources like wind, water, solar, biomass, and geothermal, that comes under the tar goal seven of the SDG agenda. And this has been, the, a plan has been made by the government of India, which is uh, spelled out here in the one, two, three, four, five, uh, uh, say, uh, action plan. So this action plan is definitely going to meet the SDG goal and targets and bring in the renewables, a very significant contribution of renewables over the conventional energy resource in our country. The challenges, of course, that we still have the dependence of coal, coal and oil and gas as transportation fuel, and it's not going to be say just like that, that you are bringing EV and EV will take over and coal, oil and gas, that will go. Transportation will still require, we still require a lot of, lot many years. And uh, in that context only I was telling that uh, now there was an article where they said that EV, EV is starting, but some, some scientists and some Companies, they are telling that EV is going to not do any great things because now hydrogen is coming. And in hydrogen also, they have the green hydrogen, brown hydrogen, and many types of, and the green hydrogen, what they say, that that is the future. So they will completely oh, ruin this. They have, somebody has even used that EV industry will totally go away. So that's, we are starting EV in India. So, yes, the issues of the conventional and green batteries with lithium use and lot of aluminum resources, production problems, cost, charging stations, related infrastructures. Of course, we don't have much EV still in India, but in foreign countries, they are, I think, they are also realizing that day before, the, I think every other day, the cost of production of a EV vehicle and operating the EV vehicle and of course the carbon, adding of the carbon and the pollution in the environment, that goes hand in hand. It's not much different, it is almost like what you do with the conventional energy. So with these, I think uh, still as on date, green, green hydrogen is supposed to be the cleanest form of the energy. Thank you very much. No, uh, I, I am particularly not aware of the adverse effect of green hydrogen. It is said that green hydrogen is the cleanest form of the energy and how we, as I understand, I am basically a geologist, not a chemist, but uh, um, what they say that uh, they will fractionate water, H2O, and then separate out the oxygen, which is also a very useful product for the environment as well as humans. And then, what we always said that the car is running from the water, what is it? So, the car is running from the water. You put in 50 liters of water and then you go happy. That, that's the, as I understand. Maybe if anybody knows, uh, has a better idea on the green fuel than uh, green hydrogen, they can contribute. <laughs> We have uh, one more presentation coming up <coughs> in this session uh, by 
Dr. Ranjan Sinha. This is from Spatio Temporal Variation of Groundwater Regime through State of the Art Monitoring Mechanism for Impact Assessment for Oil Fields of Burma Region, Burma Basin, Western Rajasthan, India. Ranjan Sinha, sir, please. Kindly come up and give it in the laptop so that it goes seamlessly. Uh, Co-chairperson, uh, myself Ranjan Sina, I'm working uh, in Ken Oil and Gas as a hydrogeologist. I'm basically a geophysicist working there as a hydrogeologist. Now I will take you through the okay. So I will take you through how we are producing oil with the help of water, as Sir rightly said, the use of water in various sectors. So here, as we know, in Barmer, the, uh, basically the oil, crude oil of Barmer is very highly viscous. So we need to inject one barrel of water, hot water into the reservoir to produce one barrel of uh, oil. So this is the mechanism that we are following. Uh, here, now if we see, this part we call a northern field development. In the north, this is the southern southern part. Uh, pointer is not working. Huh? Okay. So this part is, can I go there? Huh? So this part we call it as a northern field development. This part is southern field development. development. Huh. So, here we have total 38 producing discovered field in and around entire Barmer Basin. So this part we call it a th MBA, Mangala, Bhagyam and Aishwarya. Mangala field is the largest onshore field followed by Aishwarya and Bhagyam. In the southern field, this southern field mostly are gas, gas bearing. This oil, red color is a gas bearing field. So what we are doing basically, we are producing water that is saline water, not the fresh water, because this area being in the heart of the third desert, and nobody can impact any on the. Uh, uh, I mean, the fresh water system could not, should not be impacted because it is a notified area by Central Groundwater Board, and the first right to use of water goes to the villagers, not the industry. So what we did, we explored the deeper saline water. Now, getting water in Rajasthan is much tough, tougher than getting oil. So, what we did, so this, is, this one uh, is the, if we don't use water, without water we will be recovering only 10% of the entire reserve. And we, with water injection, another 30%. So, balance in the reservoir will be 60%. So, how to use this 30%? So, what we did, we explored one deeper saline water that is called a Thumli aquifer in the northern part. In the southern part, we discovered another Jagadiya aquifer which is highly saline. The salinity of this Jagadiya aquifer is around 30,000 ppm. And the salinity of this Thumli aquifer is around 7 to 10,000. So this 7 to 10,000 ppm of water cannot be used by any drinking or domestic purposes for... So this is the aquifer that we are producing uh, producing and injecting back into the reservoir. So in a schematic manner, I can show that this Thumli aquifer we are producing, we are mixing this Thumli uh, water with the produced water. I mean the water that is coming out with the crude oil and heating at 60 degrees C and injecting into the uh, water uh, leg of the, uh, I mean the reservoir to produce the oil. So. Now, just, just a look, quick look into the geologic section. If we see here, the Thumli aquifer is unconfined here. So this is the only fresh water available in the entire Thar Desert. And this is the area where the Mangala, our oil field Mangala is situated. So this, we cannot use this water. So what we did, we, uh, now if we see this Thumli aquifer is dipping further south. And there is a fault here. This fault, after this fault, this Thumli aquifer is completely separated from the freshwater system. I will take you through with a detailed uh, geoelectric section. And as we go down, the, this Thumli aquifer be becomes the oil bearing in the southern part. This is not a water bearing. Here, the, uh, 
this color basically this yellow color shows the oil bearing structures here thumli is uh, petroleum uh, crude oil bearing so we have discovered one jagadiya aquifer here which is separated in the in that particular scale if we see it is completely separated from the top unconfined aquifer by by a thick clay and coal bed here in this part this fatehgarh is not a oil bearing this is a water bearing so it is it is being recharged from this place so there are three aquifers present we have discovered three aquifers one the fatehgarh aquifer the thumli aquifer and the jagadi aquifer which is highly saline and it it is being used for the oil field development so the methodology that as sir rightly said the use i mean the usefulness of the geoscience so as a hydrogeologist we integrated all the geoscientific data the lithological data from the oil field the various exploratory wells the development wells the appraisal wells the geophysical logs the seismic data the modular dynamic testing data this we also used the modular dynamic testing data in, is very common in oil field where we have used the salinity to map the salinity vertically as well as laterally so the composite logs and finally the depth structure map of the top and bottom of the aquifers were inferred so that we come to a conclusion that we will abstract only the confined part which is highly saline then fo followed by water well drilling aquifer testing and well designing and long term monitoring so this mon long term monitoring that is a, is very very important as far as the compliance is concerned because central ground water board has given us the permission to abstract saline water with a condition that no fresh water should be impacted so this monitoring mechanism is the final output for through which we are satisfying the regulatory body for further permission of the renewals now this is one of the geoelectric section now if you see here in the asuria area this aquifer is unconfined so it is being recharged by the rain rainwater but rainfall is very very minimal 250 mm of rainfall annually so now you can imagine that how how much water is being recharged so after a detailed mapping we found that there, there, there is a fault and this fault separate from the thumli fresh water system with the saline water system which is there is a thick clay around 350 meter of thick clay which is making this as a confined aquifer similarly here also in this section also if we see there is a uh the, the entire thumli aquifer in this part is becomes confined which is uh, separated by a fault the seismic data is also used and we found that yes in the downthrown side of the fault there is a thumli aquifer which is highly saline so these data we combined together and the mdt data were also used to map the vertical variation of the salinity because there in the public health engineering wells or the central ground water board wells they are not tapping the confined part they are tapping only up to 250 or 300 and we have mapped up to 1000 meter so the mdt data is used for salinity mapping so the top thumli and the bottom of the thumli aquifer is mapped now if we see here the unconfined part the salinity is very very low around 4 and 406 and down south if you go it's highly saline even up to up to 10000 around so this is the top bottom of the aquifer so the bottom of the aquifer is around up to 1000 meter so here we are tapping this is the saline water field that we have developed this this saline water field is around 40, 25 km from the fresh water so there will be nil neg negligible effect on the fresh water system and which is being separated by a fault also so in 3d view if we see uh, this is the three dimensional model that we have developed uh, the dynamic model is also prepared because we need to satisfy the groundwater regulatory authority with the modeling concepts that what will be the impact of fresh water system uh, of saline water on the fresh water system so this is the uh, so if we see this depth is around uh this is at a depth of uh, this starts from 450 meter to 800 meter and this fresh water is separated by a fault so the fresh water uh the storage of the fresh water is also calculated is only 0.2% only 2% of the entire reserve so we can imagine how 
uh, the fresh water is very very the volume of the fresh water is very uh, uh, though the saline water is 98 percent so we are using this saline water now if we with the existing saline water is a such a huge saline water uh, if we use for 40 years we will be using 0.1 percent with that at, at present rate that we are abstracting we are abstracting at around uh, 30,000 cubic meter I mean around uh, 2 lakh barrel per day and with the proposed or the discovered field coming up it will be around 0.14 percent only the saline water not the fresh water so with this concept we designed the wells also the wells were designed with the packer the packer is used because suppose if there is any leakage or the integrity of the well so the top of the aquifer if any pursed aquifer is present in fact in this area pursed aquifers are very common these pursed aquifers are being used by for agricultural needs and the public health engineering wells are there so so that there is a so that there should not be any impact on the freshwater system we are using the packer uh, inflatable packer and from the depth of around 350 to 800 meter we are tapping so this is the fault that i was talking about this freshwater aquifer is this side this is the fault this fault separates from the confined saline water from the unconfined fresh water so with this this is another in the third i showed you that two part the northern field development and the southern field development in the southern field development since thumli is a uh, oil bearing structure so we are using jagadia in jagadia if you see this this is the this is the second aquifer which is separated by a clay layer and completely separated this is this clay layer this is the target aquifer this is the aquifer one this is the unconfined zone which is separated by a clay and a coal there is a coal bed myosin coal is there in the in this uh, in, in this layer so this is this also gets separated the salinity of this aquifer is more than 30000 even it goes up to 50000 even our electrical conductive meter meter, meter that goes beyond range it cannot measure so we have to send it to the lab for tds measurement so now we have installed state of art uh, telemetry system of the production well and uh, everything is we are sharing with the central groundwater board this is the telemetry system we have the user id and the password along with the link is shared with the central groundwater board so as to monitor the flow because we cannot exceed the permitted volume 50, 51,500 is for thumli aquifer so this is already shared and this has got a telemetry system with the, the, there is an antenna through satellite we send the data directly to central groundwater board for monitoring purposes so apart from that to see the impact to on the fresh water system we have drilled around 25 monitoring wells at a different location within the unconfined zone within the fresh water zone but because this is the basic need of the regulatory body that okay you you abstract the saline water for the oil production but there should not be impact so we have installed around 25 monitoring wells in an in entire unconfined fresh water aquifer and these three and not only this these these are basically uh, we are not only measuring the lateral as well as the vertical variation also so one two and three these three are at the same pad at the same well pad tapping three different aquifer the un, even within the unconfined aquifer the shallow aquifer the intermediate aquifer and the deeper aquifer we are monitoring and uh, just monitoring to check whether there is an impact on the pressure head of the aquifer or the salinity or not apart from this we have around 1800 other well village wells and irrigation wells that we monitor during the pre monsoon and post monsoon period to see what 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 is the changes and because the livelihood of the entire third desert depends on this freshwater system but so this is our not only regulatory point of view but as a social uh, responsibility also that we are checking so uh, this is what i was telling so in a particular single well pad what we did we we designed monitoring well one in the shallower part one is the intermediate part and another one is the is a deeper one 
and this is also fitted with the telemetry system automatic water level recorders are there which measures the aquifer pressure and this through a uh, i mean the satellite mechanism we are transmitting directly to central groundwater board we are also uh, monitoring from the, our headquarter our headquarter is at Balme, uh, gurgaon i am monitoring regularly to just to check whether there is any impact or not so this state of art mechanism we have followed the, and this technology that we ha i have brought it from netherland basically netherland just, as sir said the netherland basically i think madam also said the netherland uh, sits below sea level so they have a set of monitoring mechanism as soon as the head goes the pump immediately stops so this is the what we are also following in barber uh, so the long term variation if we see uh, the water level is somewhat because this depends some yes this is declining because a lot of public health engineering wells and uh, i mean the irrigation wells are coming up so all the monitoring wells are being monitored now if you see here it is almost constant this bhadres one this bhadres is a area where they are lignite mining there is a, another one companies there they are mining the lignite so they are dewatering also so to see just to check whether what 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 is the impact for others also so we have developed that monitoring mechanism so long term salinity also we are monitoring because in irrigation um, MOEF there are conditions various conditions are given to check the salinity or because we are uh, dosing in the UR we have a lot of operation UR is also going on to check the any impact due to UR or well integrity of the production uh, oil production or gas production well so the if you see the long term salinity variation in one of the village I am showing there is a little impact there is hardly any impact also just to uh, just to revive we have designed a lot of around 1200 tankas and tanklis that is artificial recharge um, project we have uh, we have developed because it that artificial recharge uh, i mean the water can be recharge can be used as a recharge for the fresh water system also so now in many part of the world uh, due to over extraction of oil and water land subsidence takes place so just to monitor the land subsidence monitoring we have a differential global positioning system so around uh, 25 rover station we have and one base station the base station what it does base station continuously uh, monitors the x y and z of that particular uh, place through eight satellites available within the horizon and it takes the average value and x y z is calculated and other rover station we use to tie up and see whether there is a, any differential changes or not so this differential global positioning system we have developed to monitor if there is any land subsidence or not as of now for last 10 years we are producing more than 10 years around 13 years we are producing but as such there is no such impact has been assessed so safe disposal another important aspect for the for just to save the environment is the safe disposal so as per the MOF guideline the disposal should be more than 1000 meter below ground level and the TSS should be less than 100 ppm and oil in water should be less than 10 ppm but in real situation more than 1000 is more than 1000 we have to follow but at the same time we have to see whether there is any reservoir or not because if within 100 meter 1100 meter let us suppose there is a clay bed so it cannot take so through detailed mapping yes we are also uh, looking into the presence of the fault also suppose the initial plan was like this then we changed because if there is any leakage or due to over pressure this fault may leak so we have tra changed the trajectory and went deep inside into the Fathagar this Fathagar reservoir this is the water leg of the uh, oil reservoir so we are dis disposing so th this is in uh, planner view if you see here we are disposing through this the deviated wells we have drilled and this goes and we are disposing here right now so we have we are uh, disposing around 32,000 barrels per day 
into this and also we are also monitoring with the special gauge system at the top. So this is all about. Yes, ma'am. If there is no question, I have, okay, you can go ahead. I'll ask later on. similar or different? No, different. See, in the fresh water system, basically it is being recharged. That is why it is fresh, right? Yes. And the saline water it is trapped. Is a tertiary period. Is a tertiary. Yes, uh, no, what, the fault uh, against this yes, fault. the fault is fault is acting as a seal. Then how so, how 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 much actually is, uh, throw throw is uh, three hundred fifty meter actually three hundred fifty uh, meter throw. There is a ugly clay. Just at, I showed you the saline water field where we are abstracting around twenty five kilometer from the fresh water zone. So at the top of that there is a three hundred fifty meter of clay. That clay is acting as a seal is a confined that is uh, i mean the even if you see the pressure difference those pressures are also different and okay. i mean the hydraulic head or in terms of pressure if you see the pressures are also different okay. thank it's you under a separate pressure system and that is why it is not it is it is saline because it is not getting recharged is during the tertiary period it was deposited okay uh, so uh, regarding the integrity of or the uh, seal uh, uh, capacity of the fault is pretty strong yeah. Because it's completely segregating the two systems, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, when you're charging for Tegar, yeah. and which is in the down depth, yeah. right? When it's you around 3,000 meter, yeah. And uh, you have a deviated well, and you're charging down dip in the Fatehgar. Yeah. But uh, up dip, uh, definitely, the, because of buoyancy, the water is going to uh, come I, up I towards, yeah, towards yeah, the, yeah, towards yeah, the yeah. fault. Because, no, so that, how that sure are you about the, uh, you know, the seal uh, um, uh, quality or uh, seal integrity of the fault itself? Uh, we did some exercises on, on the, I mean, the geomechanics part also, madam. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And normally, Normally, we take uh, the water lake of the oil reservoir. Yeah. Yeah. So, from oil water contact, it is around uh, 8 to 10 kilometer down deep. And another thing which I found a little intriguing in terms of uh, this thing was, you said, I mean, when you showed the uh, strike section along yeah. the basin, Barmer Basin, yeah. you have water in the up the part, yeah. and uh, which you said turns into oil in the southern part for Jagad uh, yeah, yeah. formation. Exactly. So why is it like? <laughs> and it's a little difficult to comprehend. I mean, what kind of a system in terms of, uh, what kind of a hydrodynamic see, system is, is that? A, yes, there's an oil bearing. Here it is water bearing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, I could see the slope of the yes, formation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I is it the same one or is it the same one. Is, is it there? I mean, there are two separate sands with the intervening uh, the heterogeneity the age, of the reservoir. Age, age of the age is a uh, is a thumbly, okay? But there are separate. It's a rifted basin, so a lot yeah, of faults are there. I understand. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, it's a rifted basin, so it might have happened that oil might have migrated earlier, and okay. yeah, that could be the. It's a little again. intriguing. I mean, I, ha, ha, when yeah. I saw that, okay. I think we can have the next one. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's yes. good. Uh, I will not ask you, but I just wanted to know what was the cost per barrel of production. <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> of course, the, 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 you know, uh, even if you are pumping water and you are then heating it up. And yes, then, yes, yes, so cost, uh, yes, cost goes high yeah. on the other uh, side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cost goes high. But yes, until and unless you use the water because you are uh, additionally you are adding 30 percent, another 30 percent. Otherwise, without water, only 10 percent can be recovered. So the the viscosity ranges between 7 to 250. It's a such a high range. In the in the southern part, the viscosity is around 7. If you go to the extreme northwest, it's yeah. 250. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. it's a range is too high. 
and uh, also in terms of API gravity, it's around 20 to 35, it ranges. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So highly Fine. viscous, actually. Yes, yes. It, as soon as it comes to the surface, it solidifies. So that is why we have a uh, uh, special heating arrangement system throughout the pipeline, from Barmet to Bhogat. Yes, I've yes. heard about it. Yes, skin so effect heating that arrangement is, system. That is additional cost in that the project. That is additional cost, yes. <laughs> yes. That is additional cost. Yes. Yes. There also we have a, this type of monitoring mechanism. So, we are uh, I mean, if I can discuss it, of course, this is conventional oil and gas domain. Yeah. So, uh, what we, uh, have you been able to maintain the reservoir pressures? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, recoveries have been 40% uh, as you're saying? As of now, 40%. Yeah. Yeah. 10 plus 30, yeah, that's yeah. what. Okay. Actually Additional 30%. Good. Thank and you. And we are using judiciously the saline water, which cannot be used. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes. That is understood. <laughs> yeah. But still, I mean, it's quite efficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. But yes, we have we have to check is any impact on the fresh water system. Then we have to relook into other aquifers also. Yeah. Because government can stop any if there is any impact. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's the biggest challenge. <laughs> So as there is no, said, there as, is no yeah. surface effluent uh, no, in no this surface, system no because surface. you are uh, yeah. doing it in a closed loop. Exactly, closed loop. Yeah. Okay, thank zero, you. Zero surface uh, discharge here. Yeah. As rightly said, sir said, the role of the geoscientist, particularly the hydrogeologist. I am a geophysicist. Yeah, I yeah. turned myself into hydrogeologist. So it yeah. doesn't make a difference what <laughs> what phase the fluid exactly. is in. You understand yeah. the subsurface yeah. and yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. thank you, thank you. Yeah.